Welcome to Travel Tales, a mini series within Distress to Joyful Bailey's Way podcast. I'm your host, Bailey Raber, here to travel the world with you. In each episode, you'll hear firsthand how my travel experiences have gone, both within the United States and abroad. Together, we'll discover new cultures, learn about a variety of new places for you to go out and explore, bring light to how I navigate my bipolar disorder while traveling, and most importantly, we'll have fun. You'll leave each episode stocked full of exciting new ideas, interesting information, and feeling like it's time to hop on a plane. So come on, friends. Let's start exploring. Hello, friends. I am back in the U.S. As you can see, if you're on YouTube, I am sitting in my pink chair in my little corner like I usually am. (laughs) And I really was hoping to be able to record this specific episode while I was still in India, but things did not go as planned, shit happened, I rolled with it, we're doing this now, everything's all good. So today we are still in India on day eight of my first trip there, and we are going to go shopping and buy our first sari. And by we and our, I mean me. (laughs) It's we because I am sharing this with you. So let's go ahead and dive on in. Upon waking up this morning, I went downstairs to find mom and dad both awake, despite the early hour it was. Dad invited me to go on a walk with him, which I excitedly agreed to. I quickly got ready and made my way over to... I quickly got ready and we made our way over to Akota Garden, a beautiful public park that was located just down the street from the house. Here we walked along the trail, which was a circle pathway. We did this a couple of times, stopping to say hello to all of dad's friends, which was basically everybody in the park. (laughs) The park was very lush, super green and full of people, despite how hot it had already despite how hot it had already become so early in the day. It was really nice to see so many people out and about getting in some morning exercise. Additionally, it was very entertaining to see the confused looks on people's faces when they saw me. A white person is in a residential area located deep within a small Indian town is not something that these people see every day. Especially because I was walking with Monish's dad. (laughs) Had I been with Moni, it would have been different. People would have made the connection, oh, that's his girlfriend, that's his wife, whatever. But me being with his dad, who's in his 60s, it's like, wait a second, what's going on here? When we returned home from our walk, I found chai and breakfast waiting for me. Moni had cooked some scrambled eggs for me and... Oh, (laughs) Moni, my wonderful fiancé, who is now actually my husband, he had cooked some scrambled eggs for both he and myself to enjoy, doing so just like how we do it at home, using plenty of Maggie Magic Masala seasoning. Which, side note, I really wish I would have put a packet over here, like easy to grab so I could show you, but Mad... Maggie Magic Masala, it is such a tongue twister, too many M's, is the best seasoning I've ever found. Like, I love spicy food, and I usually use Tony Saturies on things. If you guys are from the South, you know Tony Saturies. So, Maggie Magic Masala is better than that. I hate to say it, but it's true. It's better. (laughs) So, the morning was, was otherwise very slow moving, which is typical in India. Fun fact, shops don't usually open until 11 a.m. or later, so there really wasn't much for us to do until later on in the afternoon. So with that, we ended up spending the rest of the morning just hanging out, which is Moni's favorite pastime. Me, on the other hand, I would much rather be busy doing some sort of activity, so this was something that I would have to get used to throughout the remainder of this trip. And also, because I just came back from India and I was there again recently, I still struggle with the slow moving, hanging out, not a lot going on part of living in a smaller town in India. 
my God. <laughs> we had about a whole week where we didn't have a lot going on in our most recent trip. Sorry, let me let me be a little bit clear. When we were just there, you know, a week or two ago, we had a whole week where we didn't have a lot going on, and that was rough because it's just so slow, which Indians love that. I am very fast-paced, always busy, always doing something, and so I struggled. And I remember this specific morning when we were, you know, day eight of my first trip there, I actually sat down and I wrote a blog post. <laughs> Everybody else was just chilling, hanging out, playing on their phones, chatting a little bit. And me, I was like, I need to be occupied. So I wrote a blog post. <laughs> as the afternoon finally approached, it was time for Moni and I to get ready for our first dance practice as we would be performing a dance at his cousin's wedding in two days. For those not familiar with Indian weddings, there's often an event called the Sangeet where the bride and groom's families and friends come together to sing, dance, and celebrate the upcoming wedding. This event occurs before the Shadi, which is the actual marriage, and Sangeets have evolved over the years. So nowadays, they typically involve close relatives and friends of the couple performing choreographed dances to popular Bollywood songs on a stage. So the bride and the groom will often perform dances of their own, which adds to the fun. So Moni, myself, his sister, and his brother-in-law were scheduled to perform a dance together. So the four of us. So Tumni and Jigger, which is his sister and brother-in-law, they were still in Mumbai at this time. So Moni and I were learning the dance with the choreographer alone for the time being. And y'all, it's so much fun. It could, it might seem a little nerve wracking if you haven't grown up, you know, dancing on a stage and performing just for the hell of it. But I love this part of Indian weddings. I love the Sangeet. I love the atmosphere. I love the getting on the stage and performing. Nobody's going to boo you. If you fuck up your dance, nobody cares. They're still going to be cheering you on because it's all about having fun and just enjoying dancing and songs and singing. And it's it's a blast. I love Sangeets. <laughs> so before heading to dance class, I was introduced to a new toy, Moni Scooter. So in India, they all were... So in India, they refer to all Vespa and Vespa-like vehicles as scooters, which... That's because motorcycles are considered bikes and bicycles are considered cycles. So if I refer to a scooter, y'all think of a Vespa. Just literally think of a Vespa, except the scooter that Moni had was not Vespa brand. It was Honda, <laughs> funny enough. But just picture that when I'm saying scooter. Not like those stupid scooters that you manually use your foot for that we had in the 90s as kids growing up. <laughs> That's not the scooter we were zooming around on. So even though it was super hot outside when we left on the scooter to go to dance class, I loved it. I loved it so much. And I will always choose to ride on the scooter even in 100 plus degree weather instead of in an air conditioned car because it's just so much fun. Y'all, I love the scooter. Even this last time, it was kind of cold outside. And so I still wanted that scooter. We'll put on a jacket. We're going on the scooter. I do not care. I don't want to be in a car. I want the scooter. Let's go. <laughs> so dance practice was absolutely brutal for this American who was not accustomed to... Oh, <laughs> let me start over. So practice was... So dance practice was absolutely brutal for this American who was accustomed to having comfortable air conditioning wherever she went. So not only did the room that we were practicing So not only did the room that we were practicing in not have air conditioning, but it was also located upstairs. And y'all, heat rises. So, yeah, there were some fans in the room to help the air circulate, but with the temperature being more than 100 degrees at the time of practice, those oscillating fans were not enough for me. Oh, my God, they were not. 
so not only did our choreographer have to open the windows and doors to help circulate the air for me, but we also had to take many, many, many different breaks so that I could stand in front of the fans and chug some water. <laughs> I ended up making it through my very first practice without, without passing out, so I'd call that a win. But y'all, I was drenched in sweat, dying from the heat. It was so, so hot. And I did not expect that at all. So that was a really fun situation that I was kind of thrown into. It happens. But I've learned my lesson. So basically, anytime moving forward, if I'm having a dance practice, expect there to be little to no air circulation and fans if you're lucky you'll have some you know oscillating fans but there won't be ac so doing this in december like we just did recently for our wedding that happened a few weeks ago that was a much better experience because it was much cooler outside but at least i knew what i was getting myself into so that was a plus after dance practice we went home to get mom meaning that we had to leave the scooter behind and take the family car instead so that we could now go shopping. So it was worth the trade-off. <laughs> so we needed to purchase a couple of saris and or chanya cholis for me to wear to the wedding events that we'd all be attending later on during this week. So I'd been excited about this since first learning that I'd be attending Moni's cousin's wedding because fashion has always been a passion of mine, which if you guys have tuned in time and time again, you should know this by now. <laughs> Although, since there were four wedding events in total that we'd be attending, we technically only needed... Oh, hold up. Let's try that again. So, although there were four events in total that we'd be attending, we technically only needed to purchase two outfits for me as I had brought my own Western-style dress to wear to the wedding reception, which was the final event of the wedding, and Tunvi had given me one of her chanyacholis to wear to the haldi which is one of the events, it's a ceremony thing, which I'm actually not going to get into right now because I'm going to get into that later on down this season. <laughs> so with that said, we went out with the expectation to find one Chanya Choli for me to wear to the Sangeet and one Sari for me to wear to the marriage ceremony. So you're probably wondering, what is a Chanya Choli? Most people know what a sari is. If you don't know what a sari is, dude, that's okay. I know what a sari is because I am in fashion. So I knew about saris before I even got so, before I even like put a toe into this Indian culture that I now am like, have absorbed so much. <laughs> I knew what a sari was because I am in fashion. But if you don't know what that is, hang tight because I'm going to explain what both of these are. So. A few fun facts about these traditional Indian garments to help you better understand what I've been talking about is that, so a chanya choli is often also called a lenga choli or just lenga for short. So in Moni's home state of Gujarat, they are referred, these lengas are referred to as chanya choli. So that's what I will always refer them to. Like I will always call them a chanya choli because that's just, you know, particular to his region. Most other regions call them langas, langa cholis. So the difference between a chanya choli and a sari. So let's talk about that for a moment. So a chanya choli is a three-piece dress that includes a cropped blouse, a long skirt, and a dupatta. So the long skirt is typically floor length, and the dupatta is a shawl-like scarf that they will drape over the body. So the blouse usually allows the midriff to be exposed and the skirt is sometimes shorter than floor length. It kind of just depends. They usually try to keep it like right there to, to like minimize tripping. But I mean, I have one that's a couple inches too long and they couldn't do anything about it because it's scalloped. So if there's a scalloped edge, you can't hem that. So I just wear high heels. <laughs> so it just kind of depends on the style and what you know, which one you buy and where you're buying from. So a sari is one large rectangular piece of fabric that will be draped over the body in a dress-like fashion 
covering the entire bottom portion and finishing with a drape over the shoulder that, rep that resembles what a draped dupatta would look like. So just like a chenyacholi, a sari will be worn with a cropped blouse, although there are two major differences. So a petticoat, which is in India, they call the petticoat that goes under the sari, that is a thin skirt. They refer to that as a petticoat. So in the U.S., a petticoat for us is like something that's big and fluffy and and ha it's usually a lot of tulle and it makes your skirt really big and fluffy and like 1950s style. That's not a petticoat in India. A petticoat in India is literally just an A-line skirt that goes basically to your ankles and that's underneath the sari. So you wear that under there and then that allows the sari fabric to be tucked and pinned. So that way when they take that big long piece of fabric, they can attach it to the petticoat that you're wearing so it's more secure. So that way, you know, if something is to happen and your sari gets, I don't know, it gets caught in an escalator. <laughs> I don't know if that's ever happened to anybody, but I think that, okay, you know, I'm going to just skip over that. But <laughs> let's say it gets caught in an escalator. Then if it, you know, the sari gets ripped off, well, you're still wearing a petticoat. So you your ass is still covered. You got the blouse. You're good to go. No one's going to see you naked. Now, is that how they did it in the olden days, in ancient times? I don't know. That's worth researching. But that is definitely how they do it today. And at least that's how they do it today in the state of Gujarat, <laughs> to be specific. So why would I choose one of these dresses over the other? That's a great question, my friend. Thank you for asking. So, saris are typically more difficult to walk in as the fabric is wrapped around your legs, while a skirt in the Chenya Choli allows for a ton of free movement. It's like a skirt in the U.S., just, you know, floor length. All the movement you want. So, with that said, if you're planning to bust some moves on the dance floor, a Chenya Choli is a much better option. So, but if you're attending an event that does not involve dancing, choosing to wear a sari would make sense. And that's only if you want to. Some people hate wearing them because they're constrictive, but I fucking love them. And that's also, mind you, if you're able to pin it on yourself or if you have someone readily available to help you pin it up. <laughs> so... A little fun fact, when we are in India and we're getting ready for weddings, mom has this hairdresser that she calls. Um, we just call her the ladies. And the ladies come and they do our hair. They will do your makeup if you'd like. I never have them do my makeup. I always do my makeup myself. And then they will get us dressed in our in our outfits. And they call these dresses, they call a sari like a dress. They'll call your Chani Choli a dress. Even though technically it's not, and being, you know, the fashion guru that I am, I never call them dresses. <laughs> but they'll come and do it and gall. So obviously we pay these ladies, and they get paid to do this multiple times a day for all different clients all over the city. And holy shit, they are so fast. They will get my ass wrapped up in a sari with all the safety pins and everything done within like five minutes. It's wild so if you're on YouTube wait until the end of this video and you'll you'll get to see I I'm gonna add I did a time lapse of them doing it and it's like whoosh whoosh, whoosh and it's insane but still even with the, without the time lapse it's five minutes it's literally five minutes if you're not on YouTube then go to the episode description and click on uh, watch the photos and videos or watch the video from this that's what you want to see there's like a two, three minute long video with all the photos and videos from this day of my trip. And you'll get to see they are insane. It's like whoosh, 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 whoosh. If you ever tried it yourself, I, I haven't even tried it myself, y'all. I have not done that yet. And I should because I am, you know, a fashion designer. Like what the heck? <laughs> but why struggle when I can just pay someone in India to do it? <laughs> okay, so... Now that we know all about saris and chenya cholis and I've gotten a little bit sidetracked, let's go ahead and get back 
back to where we left off in the story. The story. Well, I guess it's the story of my life. Anyways, continuing. <laughs> we started by going to Sia Saris to check out their selection of saris. And it was a very interesting yet fun experience for me. So upon entering the store, they sat us down at a table in front of a wall that was covered from floor to ceiling in folded fabrics. So next, they asked us what our budget was and what we were looking for. And mom gave me some recommendations on what colors I should consider to wear. Since I was planning on wearing this sari to the marriage ceremony and the color choice kind of matters for these events. So we told them what our budget was and what we wanted and a few gentlemen appeared and started pulling fabric after fabric after fabric off of these shelves. Even though we told him what we wanted, they still tried pushing other things on us instead. It was very, very overwhelming to say the least, but this is a very common practice with salesmen in India. So I learned that you just have to be very firm and tell them nahi chahiye, which means I don't want that in Hindi and continue to direct them towards what you actually want. So let me get a little bit more detailed in that for you. Because I, I mean, I just recently experienced this again multiple times on our most recent trip to India a week ago. So when buying a sari, you tell them your budget and you tell them, okay, like I want light blue, for example, because I, was, I wore light blue. Moni and I matched for his friend's wedding. I had a swatch of fabric with me and I'm like, this is what I want. And they still brought purple. They brought pink. They brought yellow. I'm like, I don't want this shit. <laughs> I literally have a swatch of fabric. I'm trying to match. I want blue. We told them our budget was, I don't remember if we said 3,000 rupees or 4,000. We might have said 3,000. Our real budget was 5000 but you have to always tell them less because when you tell them 5000 they bring you 10000 or 12000 and even though we said 3000 guess what one of the most beautiful saris that they pulled out that I really really wanted was 12000 rupees i'm like yo that's four times the 3000 budget we told you so the sari that we ended up buying was just under 5,000. It was like 4,800 rupees, which I will do the math for you so you don't freak out because that sounds insane. But the rupees to USD, it's currently right now, as of January 29th, 2024, 83 rupees per US dollar. So 4,800 rupees, we're going to divide that by the 83 it's not even 60 bucks, $57.83, which I mean, if you think about it, like you're going to see the photos in just a minute. You'll see how beautiful these outfits are. That's nothing. That's literally nothing. If you were to buy that in the U.S., you would pay at least two or three times that. <laughs> so this was very, very interesting experience it's also with me being such a decisive person it can be a little frustrating because I'm like bro I said light blue and you got green on your hands I don't want to see green like show me what I want <laughs> but they would be bad salesmen if they didn't try to push something else on you because at one point we went somewhere and oh it was fabric I was buying fabric and I kept telling what I wanted and then he showed me other things that I didn't ask for and I ended up buying some of that shit too. So they're good. They know what they're doing. <laughs> so because I'd never worn a sari before, the man offered to mock drape me in a few of the saris that I was considering purchasing. They even let Moni take pictures of me being draped in them, which mom later told us is usually not allowed. So Moni thinks they allowed it because I am American and there's this very weird and uncomfortable privilege that sometimes comes with that when traveling through India. I think a lot of it is, I don't want to get into the politics or anything like that, but I do think part of it too is with me clearly being a foreigner, I'm not Indian whatsoever, you can tell by how I look, 
that they know, okay, she's got foreign dollars, so let's treat her really nicely, so maybe she'll, like, spend more of her foreign dollars here. That's, like, a theory of mine that I have. I'm not going to get into some of the political things with this, but I think that that might have a little bit to do with it, too. Just a little. Just maybe. So in the end, I settled on a beautiful navy sari that came with a red blouse, and it had gold just oh it's beautiful just wait you'll see it's I love it I wore it again recently I really love that sari I also ended up getting a second sari a completely red sari that mom labeled as a quote party sari that could be worn to parties or celebrations such as Diwali and fun fact I wore that red sari that I bought in March of 2022 <laughs> I wore that for the first time this past year in October, no, November of 2023 for a Diwali. So I did get around to doing that. And because, I, like I said a few minutes ago, I've never draped my own sari. I actually had Monish's friend's wife, who, I mean, they're my friends now too, I guess. <laughs> Bubble, Bubble did it for me. She is phenomenal at tying sari. She likes doing that. She loved doing it as a kid growing up she had told me that one time before and I asked her if she would do it and she was so sweet and she draped me in my own sari which was incredible because I would have struggled to do it myself <laughs> or taken like 20 times longer than she did but yeah so going back to the story so mom bought this red sari for me to bring back home as I would not be able to wear it to any of Hatewee's wedding events so this is because the bride traditionally wears all red on her wedding day, which is the shoddy ceremony. And just as the guests attending a wedding in the U.S. know not to wear white as that's what the bride wears, the guests attending an Indian wear wedding, excuse me, the guests attending an Indian wedding typically also don't wear red because that is the bride's color. Although nowadays, brides have started wearing other colors such as pink or gold or green. But in my opinion, I think it's still best practice not to wear red. Now, Indians might tell you something else. Um, I saw a lot of red being worn at one of Moni's friend's weddings that we attended literally two weeks ago. Yeah, we attended it literally two weeks ago. No, a week and a half ago. My God. But... The people wearing red were all the bride or the groom's family members. So I still think there's something with that. I just, you know, having grown up in the U.S. and we do not wear white to people's weddings, I think it's just respectful to just steer clear of the color the bride could possibly be wearing. Just, you know, you don't want to outshine the bride. So I don't want to be wearing something red and sparkly because what if that's more red and sparkly than what she's wearing? You never know. I just don't want to chance that personally. So after purchasing the saris, we walked next door to Ria Boutique, where we would be able to browse their selection of Chanya Cholis. So Sia only sells saris, but Ria sells Chanya Cholis as well as some more casual wear garments. So we were guided upstairs where the Chanya Cholis were, and I began to look for something that was dark green because I wanted to match what Moni would be wearing to the Sangeet. So his uncle had purchased, ah, so his uncle had a dark green jacket custom made for him to wear, and the rest of the gentlemen in the close family had the exact same jacket made, but all in different colors. So this does not always occur at weddings, but it was a very, very nice gesture from his uncle. And what I've noticed is that Indian weddings, like literally y'all, every single one is different. I don't think you will ever go to two Indian weddings that are alike. So like in this wedding, his uncle had cl like clothing made for two of the, two of the four events. And that's for all the close family members. So I was just matching myself to what Moni was wearing because that was kind of picked for him. And he got to pick the colors one, I think, Actually, maybe both times he picked the colors. I can't remember. But in this last wedding that I went to, his best friend's wedding, all of, not all, but like a lot of the, the boys who would technically be considered like groomsmen, if you want to compare it to an American wedding, 
they decided that they wanted to all match. So they all got light blue jackets and I then matched to Moni as well. So, but like the women didn't all match. Like it, there's really no like matching that's required or color scheme that's required. People just kind of do what they want. There's no bridesmaids and groomsmen like there is here in the U.S. that need to be coordinating, none of that. So this, like I said, it was a very nice gesture and it does not always occur as far as I'm aware. So trying on these three-piece Chanya Cholis was also an experience. So a lady accompanied me to the dressing room where she told me to remove my bra so that she could help me try on the blouse, which had a built-in bra sewn into it. This was very unexpected and a bit uncomfortable at first, but there is absolutely no way I would have been able to get into that outfit by myself as it required some tying up and snapping closed in the back. Therefore, I just followed her instructions and let her dress me up like a Barbie doll. <laughs> Which, you know, that was... I mean, they do that for American wedding dresses too. For wedding dresses. I've been wedding dressed trying on recently I did that in July of this past year and they helped me get into the dress but like otherwise I've never had anybody put clothes on for me so this was the very first time it ever happened I'm used to it now whatever no big deal but this was kind of like culture shock for me like oh I'm basically getting naked in front of you and you're gonna put clothes on me and this hasn't happened since I was a child cool okay <laughs> So the first Chanya Choli that I tried on was very sparkly, which I loved, but it was also very expensive due to all of the, you guessed it, the sparkles. <laughs> so I tried on a second green Chanya Choli that I actually ended up liking more, despite the fact that it came with a red dupatta. So I typically don't like pairing red and green together as they are considered Christmas colors here in the U.S., and having been born on Christmas Day, I am not head over heels for the holiday like the rest of the country seems to be. <laughs> but red and green are complementary colors, so it did actually look good together. Especially with all of the gold embellishments that were added to both the blouse and the skirt. Therefore, I went ahead and I bought this second green Chanya Choli, completing our mission of me buying two outfits that were needed to wear to two of the different wedding events. As we were leaving, I spotted a poster that contained a beautiful casual wear dress. And by casual wear dress, I mean like an everyday outfit. So Moni, being the wonderful man that he is, he noticed that I was staring at this poster and he encouraged me to try on the dress. I loved it. He loved it. Mom loved it. So Moni bought it for me. I was truly so spoiled while on this trip to India. <laughs> while on all the trips to India. It's hard not to be when the USD goes so far, y'all. So the next task at hand was taking the new saris and the Chenya Choli to the family tailor, Rajubai. So fun fact about purchasing saris, the blouse actually comes as a piece of cloth that contains an outline of what the blouse should look like. And in this outline, they usually have embellishments or embroidery that's like, this is the neckline, this is the end of the sleeves, this is the sleeve cap. Like it's literally outlined with rhinestones, embroidery, some kind of embellishment so you can actually tell. And because it's like that, once you purchase the sari, you have to take it to a tailor who will then take your measurements and stitch the fabric into a blouse. So additionally, the tailor will make the petticoat that you wear underneath, or you can actually purchase those pre-made, which is usually cheaper. I didn't find that out until this last time because we had Rajubai just make the petticoat for me when we were there. It was easier. We had so much other stuff to do. This time we had a lot more time, so we went out and bought petticoats, pre-made, 200, 300 rupees, super inexpensive, perfect, it works, it's underneath, nobody's going to see it. So the petticoat usually does not come with the sari when purchasing, that's why you have to either get it made or purchase it. And what's more, when the tailor sews your blouse, 
He will create a few rows of extra stitches in the excess seam allowance and he will not cut off any of the excess seam allowance in the process. So what this does, y'all, this is so fucking cool. This allows for an extra row or two of stitches to be easily removed where you can make the blouse larger in the event that you gain a little weight or if you let a friend who wears a size bigger than you borrow your outfit, boom. It is so genius and I am kicking myself right now. I do not have any of my blouses or my saris, chenya cholis. I have none of that with me. They are literally on their way over from India right now. We had to ship them home. We didn't have enough room in our suitcases. So I can't show you that right this second. I might make a short little video later just for funsies and stick that on YouTube because it is so cool. And if you don't know anything about sewing, it's kind of hard to imagine or picture. But think of the shirt that you're wearing right now. And if you look at your shirt, there's a seam on the side right here, right? Oh, don't mind my tattoo. There's a seam on the side. And that seam, it's kind of like cut on the edge and it's really small. So imagine if you had a couple rows of stitches and then you just had to pop one out if you got a little, you know, chunkier, or if you lost weight, then you can just sew another one, like sew another row right next to it. Y'all, with me being the seamstress that I am, this is fucking amazing because I actually had to pop the seams out of one of my, like one row of stitches in one of my sorry blouses that I was wearing. I gained a little weight, it happens. But because I know what I'm doing, I just popped it out, boom, everything was taken care of. If I wasn't a seamstress, I would have had to take it to the tailor for them to do that and spend money. Whereas, boom, I took care of it myself. And now when I lose some weight, which I'm currently working on, I will just sew another row or two. Boom, done. Everything fits. Ugh. It's just so amazing. It's just so easy to tailor this stuff. And I can keep wearing this year after year after year. It's great. I love it. I love it so much. So after dropping off the clothes to the tailor, we picked up some dinner and then we made our way back home. We just spent the rest of the evening relaxing and enjoying each other's company. And my first full day in Baroda was finally complete, but one to definitely be remembered. The end of day eight in India in March 2, 2022. <laughs> So I still, I wish I would have, gosh, I wish I would have had a sari or a chenya choli or something to physically show you right now. But since I don't have that, I am going to show you something that I brought home this time for myself. These are earrings. And what's really fun about these earrings is that they were made using a traditional embroidery. So you can see that little flower on there. That is very specific to the region of Gujarat, which is where we spent all of our time. So yeah, I bought some of these for some friends and I got a pair for myself too. And there's a little, you hear that? There's a little bell, which is fun. So yeah, I mean, I... I don't have much else to show you guys. I, <laughs> I think I've already shown most of it. We're on, what, eight, day eight, and I'm, I'm running out of things to show y'all because we're really not, we're not stuff people. Uh, we, we like to have experiences, and we like to spend our money on that. And I do have, you know, some souvenirs here and there, but I don't have, like, an army of them. So... When we move forward with more of the India trip, just be prepared that I'm not going to have a whole lot more things to physically show you, but I do have hundreds and thousands, actually thousands of photos and videos to show you guys too. So until next time, take it easy, stay grateful, and be joyful. Bye! Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Travel Tales. Head on over to whatishaybellsdoing.com slash travel 
to find the resources mentioned in today's episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating on your favorite listening platform or write a review on Apple Podcasts. Also, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on new episode releases. See you next time for another great adventure. Bye!